Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Zoo Digital interim results for the year ended March 20. Just a very quick recap on Zoo, what we do. So we're a, if you like, a picks and shovels provider in the home entertainment industry, which of course uh, these days is really all about delivery of video content for feature films and TV series over the internet, uh, so-called over-the-top OTT uh, delivery. We work for most of the major producers of um, episodic TV and feature films in the industry, including Hollywood Studios and other big um, broadcasters and distributors of content. And what we do for them is help them take their original content and prepare it so that it can be delivered all around the world through different OTT channels, as well as in many different languages. What sets us apart from others in the industry who provide those kinds of services is that we have built our organization from the very beginning in anticipation of the specific needs of the OTT market, which are very different in many respects from the way in which um, the home entertainment industry has required these kinds of services in the past. Um, obviously, uh, there has been a big shift in the industry from packaged media, that's um, DVD and Blu-ray discs, through to OTT delivery. And with that comes a host of new challenges. There's much more content that's being produced now. It's, it needs to be turned around much more quickly to be taken to market in, in shorter periods of time. The standards of quality that are expected for localized content um, is much higher. And the security provisions that are needed to ensure this content remains safe um, and is not vulnerable to being uh, leaked um, is, is all the more intense uh, these days than ever before. So we have built our organization around the new needs of this OTT industry. And, um, and that's to say we've invested um, in the development of technology in cloud computing platforms that enable us to do this work in a way that um, addresses the particular demands of the OTT market. Um, and therefore we have a, um, a superior proposition, we believe, compared with other incumbent providers who have been in this industry in many cases for, um, for a very long time. I'd just like to pass over to Phil to cover the financial highlights. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, so um, our half year results and uh, what this uh, in summary highlights is we're continuing our transition to becoming a fully fledged OTT provider. Um, top line revenues were down 4%. Uh, that's because of the 75% uh, drop off in our DVD sales. Uh, and as you can see there, uh, excluding those DVD sales actually our performance uh, improved by 7% in the period. Uh, the good news is that uh, the sales mix favoured our higher margin services, so the uh, subtitling and the um, digital packaging. So our overall gross profit uh, improved by 18% to 5.8 million in the period compared to last year. Um, and that, given our operating expenses remained flat, um, that improvement in gross profit fell to the bottom line. So our operating profit came in at uh, 400,000 uh, against a loss of 300,000 last year. Uh, for those of you who are really interested in IFRS 16, that had an impact on our, one of our key performance indicators, which is EBITDA. Uh, EBITDA moved from uh, 500,000 the same period last year to 1.8 million this year. Within that 1.8 million, 600,000 was a direct result of the change in accounting policy to IFRS 16. So excluding that, we still more than doubled our profit in the period. Uh, and then the final thing just in the highlights is the cash position, uh, positive 600 at the half year, down from 900 at the same period last year. Uh, that really just uh, is, reflects a couple of our customers who should have paid us in September, but ended up paying us in October. So that's the summary. I'll give you a bit more detail uh, later in the presentation. So a few operational highlights I'd just like to pick out. Uh, firstly, and this is uh, the major news for us um, in this period, we've been successful in being selected as a primary vendor for localization and digital packaging for a new entrant in the OTT market. Um, so what this means is that we are going to be providing um, subtitling, dubbing, and uh, digital packaging services for this, uh, this new entrant. Um, and that will be across uh, many languages in anticipation of a forthcoming um, international launch and distribution of this, uh, this new platform. Secondly, 
um, our Zoo Studio platform, which uh, we announced in the previous period, has now been adopted by a major player in the industry. Zoo Studio is uh, a new technology that we have introduced. It is, it is built upon um, uh, tools that we already had and uh, have been using internally. Uh, but Zoo Studio does a couple of things. First of all, it unifies all these separate platforms that we've developed over the years to bring uh, one consolidated ecosystem together. Um, but also it provides an ordering interface and a tool for planning the launch of new content onto particularly OTT platforms. So uh, by adopting this, uh, this platform, we are, uh, our client will be using it as a means to manage the production of all of its uh, localization and digital packaging services uh, for, a, uh, for its OTT service. And we'll be doing so across multiple vendors. So one of the key features of Zoo Studio is that we've designed it so that um, it can be adopted as a means to manage the work across multiple vendors of these kinds of services. The reason for that is that because of the level of spend that major media companies are making in localization, particularly for your OTT distribution, uh, very few of them will take um, uh, the approach of a single vendor to deliver those services. That they will always want to de-risk their operation and have multiple vendors, you know, three, maybe four, four different vendors. So we recognize an opportunity to create this platform and to provide something that doesn't already exist in the industry by which uh, particularly entrants in the OTT space can, um, can use this platform in order to manage very complex operations to prepare these materials for uh, distribution across uh, many countries and many languages as they move forward with um, global launches of their services. We received a couple of awards in the period, which is always very nice. Um, another award for our technology, in this, in this case it was a Product of the Year award, uh, that was presented at the uh, National Association of Broadcasters event, which is held every year in, in Las Vegas. And that was for Zoo Studio, so the platform I just mentioned. And we also received for the first time an award that recognizes the excellence of our services. In this case, it was for a, uh, a global TV project that we, um, that we undertook and provide, provided um, dubbing services as well as subtitling services into multiple languages. Um, I touched already on our localization ecosystem. With Zoo Studio, we are now we now have a unifi unified platform to um, to oversee the end-to-end -end delivery of all of the services that are required for OTT distribution. So we call that our Zoo localization ecosystem, and uh, this is a big focus of our marketing efforts um, as we move forward. Um, in the period, we uh, welcome Jim Wilmot, who joins us as our non-executive chairman, replacing Roger Jeans, who, um, who retired after nine years um, in post. And finally, we have uh, made a modest investment in a capability in our London facility, uh, particularly around providing uh, voice capture capabilities, as well as audio mixing. It's worth just spending a moment on the audio mixing uh, requirement. So when undertaking a dubbing project, the very last thing that happens in the process is that all of the separate recordings of all the different characters and voices are brought together and mixed alongside the so-called music and effects track in order to produce a consolidated audio stream for a, for a new language. Um, that part in the process is probably the most vulnerable point from a security standpoint, from a, a content security standpoint. And in certain instances, um, clients may uh, require us to ensure that that, that that part of the process is undertaken within our own facilities, which are subject to quite um, extreme security protocols. Uh, we already have audio mixing uh, facilities in our Los Angeles facility and we took the decision to replicate that in London, um, particularly around uh, delivery of services into some of our clients um, on this side of the pond. The OTT market has obviously uh, become very significant and indeed is, is the real uh, driver of home entertainment now, uh, given the, the ongoing decline in packaged media, uh, DVD and Blu-ray. 
Um, we're about to see a second phase of the OTT market as, um, as new services launch um, this month and in the, in the, in the months ahead. The, the OTT market was really created by uh, a number of companies offering services that you, we think of as kind of platforms for services. So these are organizations that have created a platform for delivery of content to consumers and then initially went out to license the party content, TV, TV series and, and feature films, in order to populate those, uh, uh, those platforms and, and offer a, uh, a clearly a, a service to their customers. What we're seeing now is a, a second phase in which some of the existing producers of, of content are now introducing their own services, um, and a number of them are, uh, are shown on the slide. In some cases, these content producers, uh, which are obviously very significant players in the industry, are choosing to retain their content going forward so that it can be exclusively delivered through their own proprietary over-the-top platform. So what this means is that uh, the consumer market for OTT is going to undergo quite a significant change as some significant new services are introduced into the market. And clearly for consumers, uh, we as individuals are going to have to choose which of these services we want to take. Um, and, and that will, to, to a large degree, be uh, a function of the kind of content that we like to watch and where that content can be found. Um, so I think over time, what you're likely to see is that these platforms become more and more distinct in the sense that the content that they offer, uh, a greater proportion of it will become exclusive to that platform. And that clearly becomes the point of difference in those, uh, those particular platforms. What this all means for us is, is really more opportunity. Uh, with, with each new platform comes new technical requirements to prepare and deliver entertainment content in order that it is compatible with the specific um, technologies that have been chosen by that provider. So each one of the, the platforms indicated on the slide has its own particular way in which the materials, so that's the video, the audio, uh, the captions, the subtitles, the metadata that describes the program, such as, for example, the, uh, uh, the plot synopsis, they all have their own particular way in which those things should be assembled. And therefore, uh, at the very least, each new platform uh, presents uh, new requirements that need to be serviced by companies like Zoom. But in every case, these organizer, organizations are spending billions of dollars in creating and commissioning original content that will be exclusively available on their platforms. So if you look across the market, not only do you have new channels to market, but you have more content that is being commissioned. Uh, you know, there is, there is more... TV content that is being produced now than at any other time in, in the history of the, the industry. And the, of course, this content is traveling more widely. More and more, more, and more markets, uh, countries are, are viable now for distribution of this content. And in order to maximize the penetration of any particular country, these providers will increasingly look to localize their content into the local languages of those countries. So, there are more languages into which this, uh, this content is going. So if you these things in combination, you know, more, more routes to market, more content being produced, going into more languages, um, together with the fact that dubbing is increasingly being used as a way to uh, reach uh, new markets, all equates to a much enlarged market and opportunity for the kinds of services that Zoo provides. I'd like to just briefly take you through the four strategic pillars of our plan. So these are the four key areas that we focus on internally and um, that, uh, that in combination set Zoo apart from other providers of similar services in the industry. As you know, we, uh, we lead with a service proposition. So we monetize what we do by providing services for which we charge a fee. Um, but those services across the board are delivered using proprietary software in which we have invested. So that, that software investment for us is monetized through the delivery of these services to our clients. So the first of our strategic pillars is innovation, and that is, um, that's in our DNA. This is, you know, this is who we are. We, we uh, have approached this industry in a very different way from the ways in which the, uh, the traditional providers of these services have operated. 
uh, so we invest in platforms that not only make us more efficient in the work that we do, but that also pass on benefits to our clients. And those benefits appear in a number of different ways. For example, in the, in the form of increased security. Uh, you know, when, when clients work with us, their, their content is maintained in a more secure, consistent way from end to end than it will be typically with, um, with traditional providers of services. So in the period, there are, have been two main areas of focus. Uh, our dubbing proposition, which is still in its infancy, we're only just over two years um, into offering those, those services. Um, increasingly, we have been focusing our energies there on attending to the uh, perceived vulnerabilities in the you know, existing traditional dubbing ecosystem, particularly in emerging markets. So there are a number of, of countries and regions in the world that where um, all the market forecasts predict uh, rapid growth over the next few years. Um, but those, uh, those particular markets don't have well-established, mature um, uh, dubbing uh, industry and, and players. And therefore, they are vulnerable from the perspective of quality and security, for example. So our efforts in developing further our dubbing platform um, over this period have, uh, have tended to emphasize those features that attend to those particular concerns um, in emerging markets, which are obviously also applicable in the well-established um, doing markets too. Uh, secondly, we have a, had a big focus on Zoo Studio. I've spoken about that already. Um, there are um, a whole host of new features that we uh, plan for that platform. Um, we have, you know, in terms of our our plan, our roadmap for R&D on these platforms, it runs into several years. So we, we can see lots of opportunities for us to continue to innovate, um, to enhance the platforms in order to make them more attractive, both as uh, in, in terms of the uh, benefits they bring to us in efficiencies of working, but also in the benefits they bring to our clients and, uh, and also to our freelancers who, who work with us on these projects. Um, in order to deliver localized content for multiple languages. The second of our four strategic pillars is around scale. And of course, um, we have taken uh, an approach that makes as much of our costs variable as possible. And we uh, therefore perform all of our language related work through the use of freelancers. Uh, so we have a global network of individuals who we have carefully selected and vetted and who work with us um, on projects across uh, many languages. And that is a network that we've grown considerably uh, over the period. We now have over 7,000 people as part of our, our freelance network. And these are um, individuals who cover functions such as media translation, uh, voice acting, uh, dubbing direction, um, and, and other disciplines. We've also started to take some initial steps um, to pro progress a geographical expansion. So we're certainly not about to replicate what our competitors have done and, and build um, expensive dubbing studios and bricks and mortar operations in many locations. But there are certainly some key locations, particularly in emerging markets, where we see an opportunity to establish a point of presence that can give us competitive advantage. So we've already taken some steps um, in Turkey and we're looking at other uh, regions too. Uh, collaboration is a key part uh, of our strategy. So wherever possible, um, Rather than establish uh, expensive points of presence for ourselves, uh, we have sought to partner with specialists in territory. And uh, we've continued that, uh, that program over the period. Uh, we announced in the previous period uh, a new initiative of ours called the Zoo Enabled Dubbing Studios program. And we've continued to uh, develop this and add new member uh, participants to, the, to this program. So just to say a few words about this ZEDS um, initiative, there are certain circumstances when, for various reasons, a client may require that certain dubbing is done in a traditional studio setting. And in that case, um, we want to ensure that we are able to offer that kind of service to our clients. And we do that by working in partnership with established, usually independent dubbing studios in territory. Um, and um, what those studios agree to do is to work 
in our software systems in order to undertake the voice capture uh, and the work, the dubbing work that they will under undertake on our behalf. So typically the commercial relationship here is that we have the direct relationship with the ultimate clients and where a client has a specific requirement, we can outsource certain functions to traditional dubbing studios in territory. But irrespective of how that work is undertaken, all of the, um, all of the dubbing work is actually performed within our systems. And, and therefore, despite the fact that these, we're working with some traditional providers, uh, the client continues to benefit from all of the features of our uh, dubbing platforms, in particular those around ensuring uh, quality, uh, reliability and security. Uh, finally, we have, as I mentioned already, uh, secured a significant relationship with a, a major provider, a new provider of OTT services to consumers. And, uh, and having been selected as the primary uh, partner for their studio, we expect that that will give us much improved visibility on revenues related to the preparation of original content for that platform um, going, going forward. So um, that brings uh, our relationships with preferred partners for OTT to two. Um, there are still others, as, as you know, and you're referring to a previous slide, that we um, have the opportunity to work with. And uh, we're making good progress in our discussions with a number of other um, organizations who are providing or intend to provide OTT services and are optimistic in uh, the outcomes of decisions in respect to those services uh, that will be made in due course. And back to Phil. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, a little bit more detail on the, uh, on the financial results for the half. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, top line revenue down 4% to 14.2 million. Um, but the key thing is that uh, our ongoing business, the localization and the digital packaging um, revenue streams were up 8%, um, whereas the legacy, which is the software and the DVD, in total was down 55% in the period. Um, moving on to the cost of sales, um, a better sales mix meant that we needed less direct costs, direct costs being our freelancers. Uh, those uh, directors, etc., that we uh, we use on a part-time basis when required, down 25%. And in fact, actually, as we've out outsourced more of our own QA to third parties, we actually were able to reduce um, the cost of our own direct staff who work on uh, on customer projects. And the result of those two two uh, uh, improved performances is that uh, gross profit um, up 18% to 5.8 million. Uh, operating expenses, which is our overheads um, and depreciation, amortization, uh, relatively flat, uh, only uh, an increase of 169k. That is uh, because of the expansion of our facilities. Uh, as Stuart has already mentioned, we opened the office in London, and this time last year we had just doubled our facility in LA to uh, cope with the increased capacity, capacity and workload that's coming through. So uh, other than that, everything's uh, pretty straightforward, unless you look at the EBITDA, because obviously the EBITDA has the impact of IFRS 16, the treatment of leases, where um, we managed to have an extra 600,000 of, of profit. However, uh, as I say, that, that gets uh, eliminated uh, at the operating level. And then our financing costs, which is really the loan note interest and a bit of uh, operating leases, flat to last year. So, um, so our profit uh, before tax came in at uh, $361,000 uh, compared to a loss of $225,000 last year. During the period, though, we maintained our investment in R&D, uh, very important to us, as, as Stuart has mentioned. We spent just over $600,000. Uh, we increased our marketing spend slightly, uh, went to a couple of more sh trade shows as we try and uh, show off our, our technology and our services. Um, and, and obviously we had that increase in our, our property costs. Uh, moving on to the exciting part, which is the balance sheet. Uh, the balance sheet looks very different and unfortunately that's just purely to do with IFRS 16, where you have to create this right of use asset and then you have to create this long-term liability as well. Other than that, actually, our balance sheet is very similar to what it was six months ago or 12 months ago. Uh, we've not taken on any extra 
leases or, or, or debt or borrowings. Our cash position is still positive with the 600,000 uh, compared to the 900,000 at the same period last year. Uh, and we don't revalue the, uh, the loan notes at the half year. So the exact same numbers that we're in at the full year are still sitting there at this point in time. And, and you can see where the money actually went in, in the period. Um, the biggest element being the, uh, the financing, which again is an IFRS uh, 16 adjustment because we have to, uh, in the lease payment, put a financing cost in that number. Now, a little bit more detail on the segmental analysis. So uh, this is really where you can, we can uh, uh, dig down into the, uh, the margins within the business. So we, we classify uh, our business in, in three forms. Localization is subtitling and dubbing. Uh, that was down 18% in the period, uh, mainly because we had some very large dubbing projects in the first half of last year, which weren't replicated this year. Uh, we anticipate some very large dubbing orders in the second half of the year, so for the full year, we'll actually be ahead year on year. Uh, the digital packaging, which is the OTT packaging, but also the, uh, the DVD packaging as well, still managed to go up 44%, even though the DVD uh, services were down 75%. So a, a really Im improving uh, element of our business and really reflecting the fact that we're now embedded in helping these OTT players come to market. So uh, a, good, a good revenue stream going forward. Um, and when we move on to the gross profit, you'll see it's very profitable as well. Uh, and even the software solutions, which is, uh, which is our, our, one of our legacy uh, revenue streams, uh, because we did some work for uh, one of our bigger clients, uh, actually increased by 5% in the period. Uh, moving on to the gross profit, uh, by those three lines, uh, you can see that the localization made 2.8 million, down slightly, uh, but actually in percentage terms, that's a move from 61% to 66%, reflecting the mix being more subtitling and less dubbing. Uh, and in fact, even in the subtitling year on year, we were more efficient and we moved the, um, the gross profit percentage up by 4%. So, so it's a good sign for us moving forward. On the digital packaging side, a similar story, uh, moved up from 61% to 66%. Uh, that uh, again reflects the uh, improvement in the OTT services compared to the DVD sales. Uh, and, and overall, um, you know, that, that improvement of, of nine percentage points up to 41% at the gross profit level. So we've, we've had a very good half in terms of financials. Um, and it shows that the variable cost model can be uh, very profitable uh, as we move forward. So uh, just to summarise, I'll pass back to Stuart. So just a few key points to, to highlight in, in the outlook. The first is the, the market point, really, that there are a number of new services, OTT services that are launching, um, and this op offers more opportunity. So it's, we see this as being an enlargement of the market in, in, we, which, in which we operate. There are some recently established customer relationships that we have that um, for us provide the opportunity to secure long-term business um, and from which we expect to see repeating uh, business as, uh, as more titles are passed through us and our systems. Obviously, our approach is innovative. You know, we're a technology-led company and, uh, and this particular approach we think is key to our success in uh, the recent client wins that we've, uh, we've been able to mention and we think will be increasingly important in this industry as these new challenges that are faced by traditional content owners uh, in delivering content for the OTT market um, become increasingly challenging to, to process and, uh, and our approach with the, uh, the zoo localization ecosystem provides a very efficient way in which to manage, oversee, and direct the work of uh, localization across many languages, uh, potentially through multiple uh, vendors. When we look at the uh, value of the order book at this point um, in the year compared with a year ago, uh, what I can say is that the, the recent re new relationship with this new OTT provider that we've referred to already um, is giving us um, improved visibility. So we can see um, certainly uh, work related to localization and digital packaging that will come through in our second half and beyond. Um, and that gives us, um, uh, it puts us in a position to see our way through to achieving the full year uh, market expectations. 
So finally, just uh, briefly, uh, investment summary. Clearly, our strategy is a technology-first approach to media localization and digital packaging, and uh, that is uh, unique in this in this market, uh, a market that is uh, is dominated by traditional providers of these services that are very much bricks and mortar um, operations. We have great scalability in our operation, so we've made as much of our cost base variable as possible. And through our cloud-based platforms, we can, um, we can interact with and collaborate with um, a large community of uh, freelance workers located all around the world, as well as other partners in order to enable us to uh, deliver um, large volumes of work through a largely variable cost base. Uh, this, uh, this, the OTT market clearly has come, uh, has grown enormously over the last 10 years. We still think it's in its infancy. If you look at the potential for uh, take-up, consumer take-up of these services around the world, you know, there are many exciting new emerging markets that where they've barely scratched the surface in terms of market penetration. So this is very much um, uh, a market that is uh, and will continue through a phase of growth for, uh, for many years to come. As an organization, as a management team, uh, you know, we are steeped in the culture of entertainment, but with you know, our, our, our DNA and our origins um, is in the software industry. And, um, and that discipline and approach enables us to build this, uh, this, the, these platforms and this solution for the industry that is not only unique, but specifically addresses the particular challenges that are faced by content owners and these new entrants into the OTT space as they move forward with their international launches. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Could you explain your revenue model for Zoo Studios? So Zoo Studio is, as I mentioned, it's, it's a platform that uh, does a number of things, but for our clients, what the, uh, those who will use that platform, they see, they'll see it primarily as a, essentially a project planning and ordering interface for these kinds of services. The way in which we will seek to monetize that will be, rather than to charge a fee for its use, will be to um, negotiate an arrangement such that we benefit from services that are put through um, that system and that we will fulfill. So it's really a, um, you know, a value added capability that we have that we think will, uh, from which we can benefit through an enlargement of the services that we will deliver for uh, production of localization and digital packaging. And that, sorry, you mentioned, I think that you have some agreement upfront as to future work that you will get, or is that not the case? So I think I think the kind of deals that we will do around Zoo Studio will vary from client to client, and it will be uh, you know the deals will very much depend on the particular circumstances, you know the nature of the work, uh, the time frame, the number of languages, and a whole host of, uh, of different things. So um, wherever we can, we would clearly like to come to an arrangement that sees us securing some guaranteed income, um, but. Uh, but it's it's more likely that that what we will receive will actually be better visibility on income over a period ahead. So not necessarily a you know a committed guarantee, um, and that's that's really a function of the way in which the industry works, and that clearly we're providing services that are are creative, and our performance is therefore you know a function of how well they are received by our clients. So if you're, if you're providing a creative service, it's unlikely that a, uh, a client will guarantee a volume of work to you um, because, uh, because their, their, um, their inclination to continue to place work with you will be a function of how well you do on the projects that you've already completed. So, so we think it unlikely that we will get large committed volumes of work, but we should get improved visibility on some of the work. You talk regularly about the competitive advantage that you get from these systems. Can you flesh that out a bit more? Is it price competitive? Is it quality competitive? And how do your systems deliver that? And do the customers see and value it? That's 
Great Sorry, question. it's a big question, but that, it is a big, it's, it is, it's pretty core to what you do. It is. It's, it's a great question, actually. And because um, there's one, one way of looking, one way of looking at this market and saying, well, you know, if you look at the way that it, in which it's evolved, you know, you've got these big producers of content and they need these kinds of services. And largely to date, there have been a number of providers of those services. And, um, and you know, they, they've been seen as being largely interchangeable. You know, they, they all do a job to some quality or other. Um, if they're reputable, they probably have security provisions in place, so they, they generally will keep the content secure. They will charge a rate, and they'll sort of accept going rates in the market, so there'll not be a lot of difference between um, the rates. So there's not been a lot to choose between those different vendors. So you could argue that, well, if we've got a, a kind of a better way of doing that work, what do our clients actually care? You know, because at the end of the day, they place an order with us, they agree a fee, as long as we give back to them what they asked for by the date, at the agreed rate, to the required quality and so on, then, then they're happy. And I think that's the way in which the, the market has operated in the past. But there's something about this change that's happening with OTT and, and, and it's intensifying with this new wave of, of uh, new entrants in the market, um, uh, which is the points that I've touched on already. It's the fact that there's a lot more content that's being produced than there ever was before. Um, these, these localization efforts are being managed by different groups of organizations, you know, different, different, different individuals within the ecosystem uh, compared with previously. So where previously, were, um, you know, the, um, a content producer will probably do licenses, you know, a license with someone in Germany to get its content out on TV in Germany, and that, and that licensee would, um, would take care of the, creating the German version and so on. But now in this OTT world, it's actually the content owners increasingly who are actually doing that work for themselves and they're and clearly they're facing new challenges associated with that. They're having to turn projects around more quickly um, than ever was the case before because project, products need to be taken to market because they're going to global markets. You know, again in the past, you know, a, a title will get, will get released in the US, it would probably come to the UK fairly quickly. The major European languages would follow after a few months. You know, the lesser languages a few months later. You know, by the time you got to India and China, probably everyone had already seen it there from some pirated copy. That, you know, that doesn't happen that way anymore. You know, when, when uh, one of these streaming services uh, launches a new title, increasingly it's being launched in all languages worldwide simultaneously. So there's, this is intense concentration of all the efforts that need to be done um, up front. Um, consumers' expectations of quality have risen significantly because with these new OTC services, um, consumers are associating quality with the service provider, which if you think about it is a shift in the way in which consumers probably have thought in the past. So if you, if you would go out, so if you went out previously to HMV and bought a DVD uh, in French, and you watched it at home with English subtitles, and you thought, these subtitles are terrible. You wouldn't blame HMV for that. You wouldn't associate it with the person who actually sold you that disc. You'd think it was, belongs to the person who created the content. But if you're, if you're taking a streaming service and the subtitles are poor, you blame that streaming service. You don't blame the originator of that content. So that's a real kind of mindset shift that has caused these OTT providers to take um, responsibility for maintaining a quality standard on a global basis. You know, so that so that they it's important to them. The experience that consumers have in France of watching that service is as good as watching the same content in English, even though it may be in an adaptation to a different language. And then finally, um, the the uh, security requirements have become much more intense, and that's again because of the way in which. All of these languages need to be produced in a very short period of time, you know, or, or you know, concurrently, and they're going into countries that were hitherto have not necessarily been associated with high standards of um, content security, shall we say? So you've got all the, all these things all happening at the same time, and uh, to finally get to answer your question, the the features within our platforms play to all those factors that I've I've mentioned there. So we think increasing as the market moves forward, the sort of old approach to doing, providing these services doesn't increase, it doesn't really cut it anymore because the demands are in dealing with these new challenges that we as a provider of 
services deliver on these proprietary platforms have you know unique benefits that attend to these these concerns that are that the buyers have around security around quality around uh, quick turnaround of projects uh, and so on so the answer to your question is that we have built we've built platforms and we've built a business that is really targeted on the demands of this market moving forward rather than how it used to operate in the past and it's the, and those are the areas where our platforms deliver competitive advantages that we believe will be increasingly appreciated by the big players in the industry. So, sorry, just to push a bit more on the same thing. If I'm sitting there as a potential customer, I will say to you, what is this about your platform that will produce better quality dubbing or subtitling? What is it that will make it deliverable faster? <laughs> It's, it's to do with the fact that compared with a traditional business that hinges largely on human capital to do things, our systems uh, essentially are, in, in part, deal with the management of the workflow around production. So that's to say everything is systematized. You know, things go into, you know, it's like we've built this factory for processing these projects. And at every step of the way, our systems are progressing things from one stage to the next. That doesn't mean that people aren't involved, because of course they are. You know, we're still using human translators, we're still using human voice actors and so on. But all of the touch points in between um, are all overseen and progressed automatically by our systems. So overall, there is less human intervention and then the kinds of things where humans tend to make mistakes. They tend to forget to do something. Something sits in their in tray for longer than it should. It gets delayed. You know, that doesn't happen in our, in our systems because things, as soon as one stage is finished, the system automatically moves it onto the next stage and passes it on. We're all, there are also, throughout our systems, we have uh, certain quality checks and technical checks that, uh, again, that take place automatically. So, um, for example, just as a simple example, in a subtitle, one of the clearly one of the requirements in a, in an acceptable subtitle is that you've got time to read it whilst it's on the screen. So clearly, if there are too many words in the subtitle and it's on too short, short a space of time, then you won't have time to read it. So that's something that um, our systems check automatically. You know, the, in, in other worlds, folks would check that manually and have a judge of that. Our system is, is measuring that and will be alerting a translator as they go along to say, hang on a minute, there's something wrong with that. You know, that it can't be ready in that time. You're going to need to condense the, you know, the word count in order to be able to accommodate that. that you know, that's one small example. There are lots of technical things that in, in, in our systems are taken care of and checked automatically by the, the systems themselves to, to therefore ensure that certain things can be um, assured without requiring humans to be involved in every step of the process. The final example that I'll give you is to do with dubbing. And, um, you know, dubbing is, is obviously a, a quite a, a quite a creative process. And it also involves lots of human aid, but you've got, you know, lots of voice actors, you've got a dubbing director, you know, for each language, you've got a dubbing director overseeing it. In a traditional setting, you've got um, technical operators, you know, re recording engineers and, and other folks in studios doing all sorts of things. You know, in our world, we've created a platform that again, manages this process and virtualizes some of these functions that would otherwise be done by people. And there are in that process, there are certain things that we can check automatically. So for example, the acoustic features of the recording environment is something that is checked automatically by our systems. So when, um, when a voice actor goes into perhaps, you know, their own, uh, their, the studios they own themselves, a studio they own themselves, you know, a recording room with a microphone and, you know, a laptop can be connected to the internet, before they start any recording, our systems require them to go through some checks where they listen to the environment, they check that there's no background sounds, there's no you know, air con operating that would damage the integrity of the court recording. It's also checking things like the uh, resonance of the space to make sure that's within acceptable thresholds. It's looking at the signal to, signal to noise ratio of the, uh, the microphone and the setup, it's checking that the levels are set appropriately. Um, you know, all the, it's also checking the location of their recording which uh, can be important in order to ensure, for example, that a recording is actually uh, taking place in a secure location. Because it happens in the industry that 
certain vendors might outs if they can't accommodate all the work themselves without telling the client they may outs might outsource some of their recordings to somewhere else that don't have the same security provisions that that they themselves have so one of the things that our system will do is use geolocation to check where the recording is taking place and if it's found that the recording is not taking place in the place it's supposed to be that will again flag up a, a, an issue so these are all things that are kind of baked into our systems that are um, our clients are increasingly seeing as being incredibly valuable in order to ensure that when, in this case, dubbing work is actually performed within SUDubs, that they get these things automatically. Whereas otherwise, essentially, it can be like the Wild West out there in terms of you know, exactly how the work is being done, where it's being done, with what equipment, in what environment. And it's not that uncommon in a traditional setting, particularly in some of the emerging markets, to receive, to commission a recording, get it back and find actually it's, it, you know, it's not, the, you know, the quality is not good, you know, clearly someone didn't know what they were doing with that microphone, it's inconsistent, the different voices are inconsistent and so on. Those are all things that our, our systems are checking to ensure that those kinds of mistakes um, don't happen. So you've got uh, around 200 employees, uh, 32 of them, according to one of the first slides, work in the software part. You've got 7,100 freelancers. Do the other... 170 staff manage the 7,100 freelancers? Or can you just give us more description and colour about the breakdown of that 170? Okay, so yeah, so, so about 32 people in our R&D function. So they, these are folks who are in various disciplines are developing the platforms. So we have, um, so the other, I guess, smaller groups will be, um, you know, sales where we have five people, marketing where we have three people, uh, the finance team where we have seven or eight people. Um, so the rest are involved in what we would call production services of some form or another. And they are segmented into different uh, sort of different disciplines. So we have project managers is, is one group uh, who tend to oversee projects on behalf of clients. We have a group of folks we call translation managers who are responsible for sort of the day-to-day -day relationships with our um, our translators. Uh, we have um, what we call technical quality control folks, so a team of people who are um, providing you know, very important uh, checks on, on the content to the kind of things that we can't currently um, check via automatic means. So things that just require eyes and ears to kind of sense check certain things. So that's quite a that's quite a, a significant team, uh, technical quality control, um, and, you know, and then one or two other folks around the fringes. IT is you know is three people, four people, um, and then there's twenty people in the uh, digital packaging, because we do most of that work in house, hence why it's so profitable. Yeah. yeah so those folks are essentially uh, using automated systems in the main to um, to process content to prepare it in different formats and then but then also involved in the kind of visual inspection or audio inspection of that content to make sure that it's it's been done properly and to make adjustments in the processes to make sure that it's at the right standard. Can I just ask about um, digital packaging which is obviously grown significantly in H1. How should we think about this? Is this something that relates to the setup of these new direct-to-consumer OTT platforms and therefore is it sort of a are we going through a one-off sort of bulge of digital packaging revenue that in time will will sort of you know moderate and, and fall away or is this something that's a new normal that will you'll see as a new revenue stream that will, <coughs> will sort of stick around going forward okay so in in our first half um most of the uplift that we've seen in that segment in the ott element of our digital packaging segment has been related to essentially getting back catalogue content ready for distribution through a new OTT channel. That's, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, each new entrant in the OTT market will have its own particular take on how it needs to receive assets. And so, uh, you know, if we are, if we'd be asked by a client to take content and make it ready for say three different OTT platforms, then there's probably work that needs to be done three times over in preparing that content for each of those platforms. So, um, so the, that, that kind of, in this period, that initial work was to do with back catalogue content, but, it's, but, but it represents a tiny proportion of the total volume of content that is available out there that could be 
repurposed to go out through through these channels. I guess I guess fundamentally maybe your concern is that well there is there is a back catalog and at some point whenever that may be that's going to dry up and then you know and then all that will be left will be the new stuff and so you know when is that time? I think it, it's 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 quite hard to answer that question but but um, it, it is you know it's it's hard to conceive just how much content that there is out there and and how viable a great proportion of that content is for distribution through OTT channels. So there's there's lots and lots, you know, there, there, there are probably decades of, you know, of work to be done in, uh, to prepare this content for these for these different channels. We questioned out. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks.